when a ruling class loses track of its destiny, when it has no project anymore, when it simply uh, understands itself to have the habit of rule, that we must remain in power, but with no reason to be in power, that ruling class becomes increasingly decadent. Take a look at the North Atlantic governments, you know, Mr. Biden, Trump, what's their vision for the, for the for the United States, let alone for the world? Olaf Schultz of Germany, no narrative. Rishi Sunak of the UK, no narrative. Keir Starmer, Labour Party head in the UK, no narrative of the future, no destiny, you know, for the people who govern. Emmanuel Macron, I mean, to even consider the word destiny in the same sentence as the name Emmanuel Macron. <laughs> pretty ridiculous, you know? Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. We're living in a dangerous time of hyper-imperialism, an imperialism on steroids, an imperialism that seeks to destroy and punish anyone who refuses to submit to the current crumbling order. And the imperialists have shown that, in the case of Gaza, they're willing to carry out genocide to get their way. What does this new era of hyper-imperialism actually mean? Where do Gaza, NATO, and the Cold War on China fit in? How is the decline of global North hegemony in this moment shifting the geopolitical landscape? Are there new possibilities for emergent organizations of the global South? How do we even maintain hope as we watch an exterminationist campaign unfold in Gaza? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by author, historian, and journalist Vijay Prashad, the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief correspondent for Globetrotter, and chief editor of Leftward Books. But before we jump into it, this is just part of this episode. The full interview is available to Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. BJ, welcome back to Dispatches. Great to be with you. Um, yeah, I heard there was uh, thunder outside your window, so God knows what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, we play this game in Beirut and actually all in Lebanon called uh, Thunderstorm or Israeli Airstrike. It's actually, it's a game that goes loud noises or Israeli Airstrike, which I'm being a little bit funny here, but you got to have some dark humor and dark times. And we're going to talk a bit about the dark times that we're in right now, VJ. I want to talk to you about, about Gaza, about a lot of other issues around the world, too. And I think a good place to start is, you know, you, your um, outlet, the Tricontinental Institute, just published a very, very important document called Hyperimperialism, a Dangerous, Decadent New Stage, um, and it's an excellent document. I will link to it in the description. I encourage everybody to go check it out. Uh, and so for our listeners and viewers, VJ, can you explain what is hyper imperialism and wh why does it matter? It's a really interesting um, issue, uh, looking at, at the situation in the world today, um, and trying to figure out, well, what concepts do we use? You know, um, there was a time during the conflict in Syria, when the Russians intervened in 2015 to block a U.S. regime change, and there was a lot of talk about imperialisms, you know, competing imperialisms, Russian imperialism and U.S. imperialism. Well, that, you know, provoked some thought. Is there really something called Russian imperialism or Chinese imperialism? And how does one go about doing an assessment of it? Well, one place to begin was military spending. And this was interesting because the conventional military spending outlet, the Stockholm Institute, um, you know, accepts what governments tell them about their particular military spending. So they, in, in fact, deflate U.S. military spending quite dramatically because the United States Department of Defense is only one place uh, where it's, um, you know, government spends towards arms, you know, arm, arm struggle, you know, the international arm struggle. Well, you know, you got to look, for instance, at the Department of Energy to learn about nuclear weapons spending and so on. We put everything together and then looked at all the country's military spending adjusted in a reasonable way. And we discovered that the United States is, of course, overwhelmingly the largest spender, but that's not enough. 
when you add in the NATO plus countries, you discover that 75% of global military spending, the share of global military spending, 75% is spent by the NATO plus countries. That, that is an extraordinary number. Um, China accounts for 12% of global military spending. You know, if you don't start with these material realities, get a grip of how power works, real power, um, you don't really understand what a term like imperialism means. So this was a good place to begin uh, because you really get to see that it's the United States and its bloc um, that has the capacity of blowing up bridges all over the world. Um, and in fact, you know, the Russians and the Chinese are mostly defensive powers. They don't have the capacity to go and blow up a bridge anywhere in the world. You know, they just don't have the military capacity. They don't have the aircraft carriers. They don't have um, the, the, the bases. The United States has about 900 military bases around the world. It's just a mind-blowing number. So it's merely in terms of the hardware of power, the United States and its bloc um, is got no comparison. Well, then... Mm -hmm. We worked backwards, Rania, and looked at, you know, what has imperialism meant over time? And just quickly, I'll periodize the history of imperialism very quickly. When Lenin, who wrote his pamphlet in um, 1915 and 1916, Lenin published imperialism around 1916, he made a pretty astute observation. He was interested, how come the major powers have gone to war. This was the Great War of 1914. What Lenin argued is that corporations within countries, within the territory of a country, had a tendency to develop into monopolies. And then when they wanted to exceed the boundaries of their territory, they clashed with large corporations from other territories. And that led to what Lenin argued was an inter-imperialist conflict leading to war. Well, that was correct for his time. Then you move to the post-World War II era, because really there's one long war from 1914 to 1945. If you go to the post-World War II era, the world is divided quite um, evenly into two blocks, into the capitalist-led bloc with the United States at the lead, and then the socialist bloc with the Soviet Union and for a while China and so on. And there was the third world as the third entity. Um, these two major blocs, the, so, the socialists and the communists, confronted each other directly. This was not an inter-imperialist conflict. This was a conflict between the capitalist states and the socialist states. With the collapse of the USSR, you move into a new period of unipolarity, where the United States tries to extend its power across the whole world, finding no challenge to it and subordinating Europe as a consequence. Subordination had started in the previous phase. Well, since the Third Great Depression in 2006 to 2008 onward, when the financial market collapsed in the, in the Western countries and so on, from the Third Great Depression onward, the Western countries have had a hard time, the Global North, hard time managing the, um, th their role as the unipolar agent in the world. And they have to deal with the rise of a number of countries, not just Russia and China, but India, Indonesia, other countries. And this is the phase we're in. We call it hyper-imperialist because the West, unable to actually confront these countries economically, has resorted to the use of hard power, which includes both military power, bombing and so on, coups, but also sanctions. Um, this is the era of hyper imperialism a dangerous phase because the West, being so militarily powerful, so much advantage over the others, can exercise its power almost without challenge. And it's decadent because they don't have a project uh, for, the, for the planet. They are just trying to hold on to their power. So that, in a sense, Rania, that's hyper imperialism. So that's a really, really important explanation in brief. And I really do encourage people to go check out the report because it's incredibly detailed and it goes through the historical phases that you're talking about. It has some really nice charts. Uh, I showed uh, one of them on screen for those who are watching just of the military spending that you're discussing. But to go back to, OK, the era we're in, it's hyper imperialism. Can you contextualize this in the context of Gaza 
NATO and Ukraine and the Cold War with China. Um, I think it's really important to understand those three things that might to a lot of people seem completely disconnected as being very much a part of this era of hyper-imperialism that you're talking about. Well, you know, let's just take the two main categories of our times, global north and global south. When the Russian troops entered Ukraine, there was a great deal of frustration in Western countries. They wanted very much to see countries like India, many African states and so on, break ties with Russia. These countries refused. They said, we are not going to do that. Um, India, which has a far-right government, also refused quite forthrightly. Foreign Minister Jay Shankar said, no, no, look, we're not going to do this. In fact, later he said, we don't accept the NATO mindset. Well, this provoked a lot of thinking in capitals in the global north. What is this thing called the global south? And why are they all being so disobedient? Well, they tried to understand what is the concept global south. I was quite interested in a press conference given by the Japanese foreign ministry, where the spokesperson, she was asked, what is this thing called the global south? And she had a hard time answering. And then Japan, which produces an annual blue book, their kind of report on they, how they see the world, spent some time in the blue book trying to explain the global south, but it was largely incoherent. They kept saying, we think it's basically the developing countries. That's not really a, enough of a, of a concept. You know, It's not enough analysis. Anyway, um, so we decided to look at these terms, global north and global south. And you'll understand why it's important to talk about Ukraine through this, um, this these concepts and Gaza, through these concepts. Well, the global south is for sure not a military alliance. It's not really a political unity. There is no intelligence sharing. It's a group of countries with various different little groupings that they are attempting. Certainly most of them belong to the NAM the non-aligned movement set up in 1961, but it doesn't really carry the kind of weight that it used to about 60 years ago. You know, the NAM is a much, much weakened body. Um, there are other newer groupings, the BRICS, the BRICS Plus and so on, but they've yet to actually meet their potential. Um, they are still pretty open-ended groups of countries. You know, Saudi Arabia and, and for instance, Brazil, you know, what do these countries share at this moment, not much yet, and we could get into that if you'd like. The global north, on the other hand, is actually a block. It's a political block, where the anchor of it is the G7. It's a military block. The anchor of that is NATO, and then NATO plus, with these NATO um, you know, allies and so on, South Korea, Japan. And then there's an intelligence block, the 14 eyes intelligence block, Israel, is deeply ensconced in the um, in the Global North Bloc. It's part of the 14 Eyes Network. It's very much part of the kind of NATO worldview and so on. Um, so it has to be understood as part of the Global North. Now, the West, or, or the United States in particular, has been almost desperate to find a way to deal with Russia and, and China in particular. The Chinese economy has just exploded since um, the same time as the collapse of the Third Great Depression has struck the North Atlantic states and much of the former Third World. Um, you know, the Great Depression really is something that these countries can't get out of. And yet China has exited this particular predicament. This has really frustrated Western countries. They've tried to kneecap the Chinese economy, can't use Huawei, don't let them have semiconductor chips and so on. None of this seems to be working. On the other side, um, because of the idiocy of the U.S. wars, you know, the war um, against Iran, sanctions war, but it's really a war by any other name, the war against Iraq, the war against Libya and so on, energy uh, transfers into Europe have been really compromised. You know, you couldn't get uh, much of the Middle East energy easy into Iran, uh, into Europe. So Europe began to rely more and more on Russian energy. This frustrated the United States. Russia began to have a greater impact um, on Europe. So what you began to see was this integration of Eurasia. And the United States basically understood that to weaken Russia, the phrase used by Lloyd Austin, Ukraine was an excellent instrument. And to weaken China, Taiwan was a great instrument. These were the two principal you know, little pokes 
against both Russia and China. Now, it's interesting. What does Gaza have to do with all this? Well, we know that the question of Palestine has a slightly separate uh, you know, trajectory. It's, it's about the Israeli supremacist idea that they will one way or the other either expel all the Palestinians, kill them or subordinate them into second, third class citizens. That's a slightly separate dynamic. When this conflict breaks out with this qualitatively new bombardment of Gaza, it's, it's not like any war I've seen, you know, not even like the wars that were there in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's, it's really different. It dragged itself into this conflict where the global north uh, had to fully defend Israel, fully back Israel in this genocidal conflict. And the global south countries lined up behind Palestine, including China and, and Russia, had to line up behind Palestine. So the conflict where the front lines were Ukraine and Taiwan also became Gaza, even though the, 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 the Palestinian question was slightly removed from it. It has been dragged into this. So that's why you see countries like South Africa, you know, take a complaint against Israel to the International Court of Justice. It's not the first time South Africa has done this. They did this around the apartheid wall in 2002 and won. But they've come now to directly confront the global north countries. So this conflict between the global north and the rest, um, you know, has now become also part of the uh, Palestine question, where Israel has thought, you know, we'll just wallop the Palestinians as normal and this time qualitatively much more harsh bombardment and we'll get a clean pass from everybody. But they, I think they were also surprised to see this new mood in the South exert itself. And so in that sense, these things are part of the same story now. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And then one aspect of the Tricon report um, that uh, it goes into some detail is the idea of the decline of the West. And I think, you know, on the surface, the West seems stronger than ever, right? Like it's able to, you know, the U S has all these military bases that we showed, you know, you talked about the amount of military spending by these, you know, U S led NATO bloc countries, which is 75% of the world's military spending. They have a presence all around the world. They're able to control economies. They sanction a third of the world. They're able to carry out a genocide quite horrifically live streamed in front of all of us. Um, and uh, it feels like at this point, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this a little bit further into this episode. And it feel, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to feel helpless about their ability to even stop that in these supposedly democratic countries. But all that's to say, you know, how do you reconcile what I just laid out with the idea that the West is in decline? Um, can you elaborate on what it means for the West to be in some sort of decline? And I know the report goes specifically into what that has meant for Europe and Japan, for example. Yeah, so, you know, the, the subtitle of the report uses two words, decadent and dangerous. I already alluded to them. Let's come back to the word decadent because it's important. And it was chosen quite precisely. What does decadent have to do with the current stage? What is decadence? You see... When a leadership of any kind, but in particular since the French Revolution, when the various bourgeoisies, you know, the, the middle classes that helped overthrow monarchies, when they came uh, into the public eye, when they came before the people, the mass of the people, they had a project. You know, they had something to say, like, we're going to overthrow the monarchy and we're going to create a civilization of egalité, Liberté, fraternité, you know, the, this was the clarion call of the French Revolution. It resounded and it had it had a material basis to it that we're going to create a state structure where you don't have to walk around bowing to people because they're monarchs. Um, that means that merchants don't have to pay an enormous tax to keep Versailles going and so on. Um, we're going to have business flourish. Uh, we're going to have ordinary people uh, have dignity and so on. That was a project, you know, a real project. It was the project of the bourgeoisie. And it lasted for a long period of time. I mean, you know, let, let's not underestimate the power of that project. It, it succeeded in overthrowing a number of monarchs uh, around the world, not just in, in Europe. Um, you know, part of this was the revolution in the United States against 
uh, the British, you know, it had a certain charge. The people who were there, you know, racists and slavers that they were, nonetheless, they had a project. We're going to do this for the people, only whites in the United States. But that was still a project. They had some idea of how the future was going to look. Um, when the Russian Revolution took place, there was a serious project there. You know, um, you know, Lenin and company said, we're going to erase illiteracy. We're going to erase hunger. We're going to do all these great things. We have a project. When a ruling class loses track of its destiny, when it has no project anymore, when it simply uh, understands itself to have the habit of rule, that we must remain in power, but with no reason to be in power, that ruling class becomes increasingly decadent. And we've seen this over history. You know, the decadence of ruling classes would just lose the energy uh, to do anything. But take a look at the North Atlantic governments. You know, Mr. Mm -hmm. Biden, Trump, what's their vision for the, for, the, for the United States, let alone for the world? They don't have a vision for the United States. You know, minor things you know, um, income, earned income tax credits. I mean, that's not a vision. What's a compelling narrative um, that you have? Olaf Schultz of Germany, no narrative. Rishi Sunak of the UK, no narrative. Keir Starmer, Labour Party head in the UK, no narrative of the future, no destiny, you know, for the people who govern. Emmanuel Macron, I mean, to even consider the word destiny in the same sentence as the name Emmanuel Macron, <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous, you know. You don't have an understanding of their role in the world. And what that does is, if you don't have a project, if you don't have a compelling reason to be um, seeking power, you are decadent because all that you're concerned about is the exercise of power itself. And you see this increasingly in these countries where rather than allow the conversation, you know, and, and I mean the conversation, rather than allow the conversation, you know, let's talk about um, what the world should look like they want to repress the conversation. So, you know, you started talking about people in the advanced uh, states, you know, in the North Atlantic states, they're feeling demoralized around the question of, of Israel's genocidal war. Um, you know, you began to talk about that. Well, let's think about that for a minute. Um, these are, you know, an entire new generation of people who feel completely dispirited by the fact that their ruling elites have no idea why they're even supporting Israel. They have no idea. They have no way to have the conversation. And because they don't want to have the conversation, they say, oh, you are all agents of Russia, or you are paid by the Chinese, um, or we're going to send the police in to smash you. I mean, those pictures from Italy of the police, heavily armed police, they look like Robocop, smashing high school students who are marching to end the genocide in Gaza. That, Rania, that, that video itself, which, you know, traveled on Instagram and TikTok and so on, that video itself is, an, is, is, a, is a definition of the decadence of the ruling class. It's decadent because it has no project, merely the desire to keep ruling. And that's not enough. Yeah, I actually want to quote one of your recent pieces in Globetrotter. You write, what is so particularly bewildering is that large sections of the population in the countries of the North want an immediate ceasefire. And yet their leaders disregard their opinions. And you point to this as uh, evidence of a failure of leadership in the global north, which goes along with everything you're saying. I think that there's a new generation of people who recognize that their governments are not democratic, especially now you've got this like TikTok ban uh, coming. Um, but, you know, I want to I want to I want you to elaborate a bit on what you started to allude to here, and that is the the feeling of like helplessness around Gaza, you know, and I guess maybe here I'm asking you for a bit of a pep talk, BJ, but I can't think of anybody better position than you to give a good pep talk. Um, for anybody who's watching who has not seen BJ speak live, uh, you always have a way of riling up a crowd. <laughs> and if I'm in it, I always get riled up myself. So, you know, I think that it feels right now, and I'm not just speaking for myself here because I know I'm speaking to a way that many people feel in this moment. It feels like we're losing Gaza like Israel might just get away with it all. Like they might really just carry out their genocide and we can't do anything to stop it. Um, and, you know, I guess, and this is a big question. I don't know if you have the answer to it, but any words of wisdom help. I mean, what do we do in a moment like this? How do we prevent 
more importantly, how do we prevent those who do care from becoming helpless and hopeless and just kind of, you know, throwing their hands up and saying, I, there's nothing I can do. I give up. Um, cause right now it really does. It feels like Gaza is being lost. And I don't say that to like offend anyone or take away from the fact that there are people every single day resisting and fighting and surviving. Um, it's just a matter of like what we're seeing is so incredibly devastating and soul crushing. And, and it really makes it difficult to see any sort of light at the end of the tunnel right now. Well, let's start by saying that the Palestinians have faced things like this for a very long time. I mean, after all, um, we generally start in 1948 at the Nakba, 750,000 people expelled from their homes, but you could even start a decade earlier um, in the 1930s when the migration of European Jews began in large numbers into Palestine and was bewildering because the Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims, Palestinian Jews lived side by side. And I think people were bewildered. You know, why are these people coming from Europe, uh, running from a European problem, European anti-Semitism, and, you know, trying to solve a European um, racist problem on our backs. I mean, this has been going for a very long time and bewilderingly because um, the Palestinians by themselves, and I mean Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Jews were not responsible for this problem. It was dumped on them by British imperialism and by Zionism. This has been going for a very long time at great cost, great suffering. Um, you know, as I said, 1948, the suffering was extreme. Uh, and hideous, you know, and, and the memories of that are live, vital memories. You know, the very fact that Palestinian families continue to carry the keys to their homes from which their ancestors um, were expelled is, is compelling. People refusing to take citizenship in neighboring countries because they have a right to return. UN Resolution 194. I mean, this has been a long struggle in Gaza itself um, from roughly... 2000, you know, or maybe the, or, yeah, the second intifada for 24 years, the people of Gaza have been pummeled by the Israelis. And, you know, people have a misread of Gaza. Gaza between wars reconstructs. I mean, there's there are malls in Gaza, for God's sake. You know, there were universities in Gaza. Um, there were middle class housing in Gaza, apartment buildings in Gaza. Gaza isn't a refugee camp. When people say, you know, it's the largest concentration camp or, you know, open air prison and so on. It's not entirely true. There were people who built quite rich and productive lives in Gaza. You know, it wasn't just a string of UN tents. It's a very great illusion, actually. What the Israelis keep destroying is what the Palestinians keep building. It's not that the Palestinians have been living in bunkers waiting for bombing. They built beautiful buildings. They built a beautiful port. There were fishing boats and so on routinely the israelis have come in and destroyed all that infrastructure built with great um you know sweat and tears by the palestinian people so now having said all that rania let's get right to it i mean firstly none of the global north wars since you know i don't know when maybe the korean war none of the global north wars have been won the united states for instance and its nato pals were defeated by the taliban in afghanistan they lost the war in Iraq. They were not able to overthrow the government of Bashar al-Assad. They, in fact, lost the war in Libya because they didn't attain any war aims. They just destroyed the country. Um, they haven't won a war. You know, I mean, Iran still standing. Yemen still standing. Uh, which war have you won? You know, you overthrow governments. They overthrow the government of Salvador Allende, not far from where I'm sitting in Santiago. But now you have a great you know, admirer of Salvador Allende in the presidency. Now, he may not be a big leftist person or anything, but the left hasn't vanished. The Communist Party is the largest political party in Chile. Uh, we're going to keep coming back. You can't win. Face it. I think that's important. The Israelis went into Gaza, I think, with very poor, um, you know, understanding of what they were going to do. Okay, phase one of the war, destroy the infrastructure, check. They succeeded. They destroyed everything. They destroyed bakeries. They destroyed fishing boats. Hence now near famine conditions. They, in fact, it's not just Israelis are not allowing aid in. They've systematically destroyed 
the ability of the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, to produce food systematically so that now people are eating grass um, in Gaza. So phase one, destroy infrastructure check. Phase two, enter Gaza with the Israeli army and start to occupy Gaza. Wait a minute. This wasn't going so well. The resistance fought back against the Israeli troops. Phase three, Israel pulls back to the perimeter, come in during the day, conduct raids and go back to the perimeter. That's where the Israeli military is at now. They're still at phase one, continue to bomb, and then they're at phase three. Phase two is gone. They're not trying to enter in with massive troop deployments because however depleted that resistance, you know, some elderly gent with a pop gun is firing at the soldiers. You know, they, they just are not going to permit um, the Israelis easy access. So the fight is still going on inside Gaza against all odds. You know, I mean, I, I find it remarkable um, that the forces of Islamic Jihad and Hamas and others are able to regroup and continue to attack Israelis as they enter. Um, so they are not in phase two anymore. And I think that's significant. You know, now, what does it mean for the Israelis to win in Gaza? For them to win in Gaza, and they've said it, you know, it was part of the South African complaint to the International Court of Justice, that long section of statements made by Israeli. They want to remove the Palestinians into Egypt. That's what they want to do. They're sort of bulldozing from Gaza City, south, across Wadi Gaza, to through Khan Yunis, through Rafah, right to Sinai. Send them to Sinai. But the Palestinians are not moving. This bombing in Rafah is going to be instructive. When they start bombing in Rafah, what will happen? Will the Palestinians cross into Sinai? You know, I have friends who are sitting in Rafah waiting for what's happening, and they all say we're not leaving because if we leave, we'll never be allowed to come back in. So we'd rather die here than cross, cross into Egypt. Lots of people have that conversation every day. You know, do we go or do we stay? And, and many are saying we're going to stay because we cannot afford to leave. The Israelis don't have a way to win this. You know, they have a way to kill very many more people. But the more people they kill and the longer this takes, the more delegitimized Israel becomes in the eyes of the world population. And the entire decadent ruling elite of the Israeli government will no longer be able to travel overseas because wherever they go, they will be haunted by these young protesters and by lawyers who will try to arrest them based on the principle of universal jurisdiction. You know, what applied to Augusto Pinochet, the dictator of Chile, where he was haunted during his foreign visits, particularly to England, and then arrested thanks to Bartholomew Garzon's, the judge in Spain, Bartholomew Garzon's warrant. He was arrested. Um, that fear will be there among high officials of the Israeli government. Wherever they go, Isaac Herzog, if you arrive in Bogota, Gustavo Petro will come to the airport and personally arrest you. You know, Naledi Pandor, foreign minister of South Africa, said any South African citizen who has fought in the Israeli army during this war, if they return to South Africa, they will be arrested. She has already gone on the record to say that. These people will not sleep a night in peace from now on. We will haunt them every day and wherever they are. So I don't think... This is a period of demoralization or dispiriting. Firstly, we cannot be more demoralized than the Palestinians who are not demoralized. They continue to fight against this occupation. They are not letting go. They are not blinking. You know, the bulk of people are saying we are going to stand and we are going to fight. And then all those, that entire generation that's been radicalized, coming on the streets, you know, of, of New York, of London, whatever, you can't underestimate the power of young people who have not been in protest before coming out on something like this, you know, every day coming for some protest or the other, shutting down roads. This has an immense radicalizing impact. And the ruling class knows this. That's why they're trembling at it. They want to shut it down. Um, you know, this protest movement is significant. And when this conflict starts to come to an end directly, and then these officials travel, these same young people, are going to go and surround the hotel. They are going to surround the speaking venue. They are going to continue to disrupt speeches made by Israeli high officials. Nobody is going to leave them in peace. They will never have peace in their life. 
I mean, that's exactly what I needed to hear, VJ. Um, Cause that, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to lose hope. And I think that, you know, we also have to look at history. I mean, there's the, in the sense that liberation costs, it, ta- it takes a lot of sacrifice and it generally does cost a lot of lives. Um, And before I get to like the next thing I really want to sort of uh, segue into here, I also think that what you're talking about is so important in terms of the sort of like emerging movements, even in the global north. I mean, when we and of course, in the global south, because when we think about what's happening right now, it's really drawn a line in the sand. And I think it's shown the absolute irrelevance of a lot of these like international and even local NGO type organizations or institutions that run around being like, we can put band-aids on imperialism. Like we can mediate between these people, negotiate between these people, or we can set up some, you know, shelter so that a few kids can get blankets. Or, you know, like there's so much of this that's been happening for so long across the region, uh, in the Middle East, across Latin America, across Asia, where it's like an entire peace industry, if you will. And it's never been more irrelevant and pathetic to watch than now, especially as I see, I'm not going to name names, but I see even a lot of people here in Lebanon who haven't said a word about the genocide literally happening next door, but they're still involved with these weird, like, like liberal NGOs that help women and help LGBTQ rights and have nothing to say about South Lebanon getting bombed. Uh, But all that's to say, that's just like, all that entire industry has been demonstrated to be fake. And I use that as a segue to talk about something else that the report delves a little bit into. And that is the idea of these emerging sort of global South organizations or the possibilities for them uh, in this moment, as we see this kind of, you know, gradual collapse of leadership in the global North and of institutions, the uselessness of this like peace, NGO industry that's never actually given us anything. Meanwhile, you see the rise of popular movements across the world, you know, a lot of them coming around the issue of Palestine. And I even want to draw into that popular movements in the region. I mean, and certain countries, when you look at the poorest country in the region, like Yemen, I mean, Yemen has been such a huge player in in terms of actually imposing material consequences on Israel, and as well as these various armed groups across the region that are part of the, you know, the quote unquote resistance axis. So all that, you know, is to ask you about, you know, what do you have to say about the idea or potential in a moment like this for Global South organizations and what they could be capable of um, as we head into this really dangerous, decadent, you know, world of hyper imperialism? Yeah, firstly, I must say you do the NGO accent excellently. Um, I mean, that itself <laughs> is, is, yeah, no, that that's that's interesting. Um, obviously, you know, you recognize that there are uh, many kinds of NGOs and many kinds of people operating. I mean, just not that I want to defend them, but I do want to um, tip my hat to the Norwegian Refugee Co- uh, Council, which operating in Gaza has been really, you know, picked up a lot of the slack um, when the UN has been attacked. And and that has actually had an impact um, even within Norway. Norway's attitude as a country uh, regarding this conflict, I think, is shaped by the fact that the NRC has been so active in the front lines um, inside Gaza. But you're absolutely correct. There is a kind of bankruptcy of the NGO, which tries to be non-political, and mm-hmm. believes that war is political. Well, certainly war is political, but war is also inhuman. And therefore, because it's inhuman and it's it's something to do with humanity, um, you know, a nonprofit organization or non-government organization feel, must be obliged to have an opinion about inhumanity. I think it's impossible to remain silent. You see, part of the problem we are facing is we are at a time, and, and this uh, issue in Ukraine and Gaza have accelerated it, we are at a time when these global South blocks or, you know, not blocks, these, these countries or these platforms and so on are trying to find their voice. And, you know, for a long time, there was a lack of confidence, just to use that word. There was a lack of confidence. Like, could you really speak out and frontally challenge the, the global North? Could, could it be possible? And most countries just didn't have the confidence. You know, they felt that if they would do so, and quite rightly they felt this, if they would do so, they'd get sanctioned. And I don't just mean like the harsh unilateral 
coercive sanctions, but they face a sanction from the International Monetary Fund, which would come in and say, look, you know, we're not sure about your economic, um, your your situation. You know, we, we may not uh, uh, give you a report that allows you to get financing uh, to cover your balance of payments and so on. That that stuff was was really serious for countries, and they felt then that disobedience uh, had came at a price, and the price was too severe. So for a long period of time, from the collapse of the Soviet Union onward, most of the countries of the emerging global south held their peace. You know, you know, when you talk privately to the heads of governments, they would say things which they could never say in public. I mean, I, I don't want to even name names because why should I speak on their behalf? But I've visited several people used to be Marxists, um, then became quote unquote liberals, became heads of government in countries. I'm talking about two in particular on the African continent. I knew know them very well. They were heads of government, one in the 1990s, one in the 2000s. And when you'd go see them privately, they would fulminate against imperialism, even use the word imperialism, you know, pretty harsh against Washington, the Washington consensus, all of that. But then they would go out in public and say, well, you know, we are trying our best to get our finances in order. Um, we are trying to be prudent with the way that we spend. We are not going to overspend in health and education. We want to make sure that our currency is not out of control, blah, blah, blah. Things that I know they didn't believe in because there was no space of maneuver. You know, people don't understand what it means to have no space of maneuver. You know, they literally had no space to maneuver. If they went out of that space and challenge the West frontally, they would get sanctioned, they'd be gone. Um, you know, they'd be out of office in a day. They, they wouldn't last. So it was a compromise. They compromised and tried to do a few social democratic things, whatever. I'm not justifying them. I'm merely saying that was a period in world history. But now the, the situation is opened up because countries realize, like the country of Namibia, which has been forthright in its criticism of, of Germany, forthright in its criticism of um, the NATO war in Ukraine, the situation in Gaza. See, Namibia used to be completely under the grip of the International Monetary Fund. But now it has choices, Rania, and that changes the situation. Now Namibia can borrow from the People's Bank of China or the New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. It can come to a country like India and seek concessionary financing. It can look for investment from Indonesia, or from the Gulf Arab states and so on. They don't really need Washington or they are not under the grip of Washington like they used to be. So this has increased the space of maneuver. So now the, the people in government in these countries can say things, including the government of South Africa. They can be braver. Of course, the U.S. government tries to slap sanctions. They just got a bill in Congress against South Africa. It's a ridiculous bill. I don't think it will go anywhere. It's not going to advance, but it's a it's a gesture to tell the South Africans, you know, we're going to, you know, we'll discipline you. Not going to do it. They don't feel disciplined by you. They have options of going elsewhere for concessionary financing and so on. That has created the possibility for confidence. That itself doesn't create confidence. Now we'll see, Rania, if the confidence grows, if these countries or these new platforms, you know, the BRICS as one, if they'll be able to act on the basis of this confidence. We see this with China. You know, you would not be um, a human being today if you were not frustrated with the Chinese. Why aren't they doing more? You know, why aren't the Chinese sending, um, you know, big, you know, huge cargo vessels of food uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean? You know, why are you waiting for the Yanks to build some sort of temporary pier? Just bring a pontoon boat filled with supplies and supply the people of Gaza. Well, in fact, the Chinese are cautious. They've made very strong statements against the occupation over the last period. They've condemned this war and so on. But people may not know this. The Lebanese know this, that the United States has a flotilla of military vessels sitting in the eastern Mediterranean, effectively cordoning out um, the uh, waters of Lebanon, protecting Israel, and the waters of Gaza cordoned by the U.S. military. So the, the, there's no way that Chinese are going to confront um, the United States by sending ships into that part of the region. They don't yet have that confidence even to send large uh, convoy of food and you know electrical equipment to Cuba, which could use it. You know, and, and the port is open. Why, why isn't this happening? Because we have the social basis of confidence is now there. 
even the confidence is there people are saying things but when will they do things and that's the next phase we're not there yet you know we're not at the phase yet where we're going to see um people break through the cordon of imperialism and exert themselves and say we don't we don't care what can you do you're going to shoot down a, a ship full of food i don't think so that confidence has not attained that level but the door is opening we're going towards that and i don't know when it's going to happen i hope it accelerates but it's not happening fast enough Yeah, you know, and I also think we shouldn't underestimate the power of the images we're seeing in the sense that you know, yes, it's Israel doing it to Gaza, but Israel's also setting some very horrifying precedents for what the global north has now demonstrated they find acceptable behavior. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com/breakthroughnews.